Hey there, self-care warriors. Welcome back to Self-Care Haven. Today has been just a miraculous day, and I'm very, very excited to share with you the news that uh, my upcoming book, which is now available for pre-order on Amazon, has actually reached the Amazon best-selling list, and it's actually number two uh, in best-selling books uh, for personality disorders. So the book is called ready for it? <laughs> it's called Becoming the Narcissist's Nightmare. How to devalue and discard the narcissist while supplying yourself. And it will be available in print. I'm actually holding a proof copy right now of this book for you to see. Um, but it will be available in print shortly after its ebook release as well. And if you haven't already, please do go on and go on Amazon and pre-order that book. And I am so excited to be sharing this news with you because it's actually right next to um, Jackson McKenzie's Psychopath Free book. And that is a book that has changed the lives of millions. And I'm just so honored to even be uh, next to someone who has influenced the lives of so many, including my own. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your support. Thank you for all the encouragement. Thank you for those who completed the survey. It's been so helpful and insightful uh, to the shaping of this book. And not only will this book be including groundbreaking research on narcissism, it will also include uh, information and insights drawn from thousands of survivor accounts just like the ones that you've provided. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for contributing to this book. Um, it will also feature articles uh, by popular bloggers and writers on the top of narcissistic abuse. So I'm very excited uh, to share those with you as well. Uh, so I wanted to share also the, the news that my interview with Mental Health News Radio is out. It's live. It's on their their website, and you can check it out in the link below, or you can wait until the end of this video, and I will be incorporating it into this video as well. The audio will be available in this particular video. Um, but again, I encourage you all to check out their wonderful wonderful platform. It's an amazing platform for the mental health community and it has really raised so much awareness about narcissistic abuse using the accounts of psychologists and authors, survivors and advocates from all different types of backgrounds and perspectives. So I encourage you to look at their lineup um, after you watch the show um, and make sure that you look at the lineup and learn everything you can from it because these are so many amazing perspectives to learn from. So I'm excited to share this interview with you all. I'm very, very, very proud of it and I'm very proud of the work that um, Kristen Walker and Melanie Van have done and have put into creating these interviews and creating this dialogue about narcissistic abuse that is so needed in this world. So without further ado, here is the interview, and if you prefer to hear it or listen to it um, on their platform, make sure that you check out the links below. It will include the entire blog entry of the interview questions and answers, um, as well as their radio show and their lineup. So be sure to check those out. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio, your source for information about mental health providers and the work they do in the world, the organizations that support their work, volunteers, and mental health consumers. This show is brought to you by EverythingEHR.com, devoted to helping mental health organizations find the best electronic health record software and revenue cycle management solutions. Thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, this is Kristen Sinanta Walker, host of Mental Health News Radio and CEO of Everything EHR. Today's guest, Shahida Arabi, is the author of The Smart Girl's Guide to Self-Care, which is a bestseller on Amazon. She has her master's degree from Columbia University, where she studied the effects of bullying across the life course trajectory. She is the founder and editor of the blog Self-Care Haven, which has over 1.6 million views and has been shared worldwide. Passionate about using her knowledge base in psychology, sociology, gender studies, and mental health, her own personal experiences are utilized to help survivors of emotional and psychological trauma stage their own recovery from abuse. Her writing has been featured in several award-winning blogs and magazines. She has a popular YouTube channel, and she is currently working on her second book, Becoming the Narcissist Nightmare, How to Devalue and Discard the Narcissist, 
while supplying yourself. We can't wait for it to be put out. Today, we discuss narcissism in detail with a profound focus on healing after a relationship with an emotional abuser. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Shahida. Thank you so much for joining us on Mental Health News Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I found you, of course, because of your prolific writing on your blog, um, Self Care Haven is what it's called, correct? Yes, Self Care Haven. Okay. And you, you've written two books, actually. Um, what is your second book on narcissistic abuse about? So I'm currently working on the second book. It's called uh, Becoming the Narcissist's Nightmare, How to Devalue and Discard the Narcissist While Supplying Yourself. Mm, and it's, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Thank you. I'm very proud of the wordplay. <laughs> and it's specifically about the dynamics of narcissistic abuse that's not taught in classrooms or the DSM. Um, it goes into the red flags of narcissistic behavior which can be, as you know, very covert and underhanded. Yes. Um, it also goes into a lot of the addiction to our narcissistic partner, mm. as well as how to detach and heal from narcissistic abuse, especially if you've been involved with more than one narcissist in your lifetime or you were raised by a narcissistic parent. So I talk a lot about trauma reenactment and trauma repetition, repetition uh, which happens if we're subconsciously programmed in childhood and primed uh, to meet narcissistic partners in adulthood. And what I really want to do with this book is to fill this gap that I saw as a survivor when I started out blogging. Mm -hmm. So when I first started blogging in the survivor community, I didn't see many articles about the actual biochemical bonding that takes place between mm. abusers and survivors, chemicals and hormones like oxytocin, dopamine, dopamine cortisol, adrenaline, um, and I didn't see much about how our own brain chemistry can get us locked into this type of traumatic relationship. There's a lot of uh, research on how it affects romantic relationships, but not towards this type of abuse, right. um, which can be very, very insidious and malicious. So I really wanted to create this dialogue on, on that addiction, as well as how abuse survivors are conditioned by the abuse cycle to start to see themselves through the eyes of their abusers. Right. Um, so in addition to biochemical bonding and trauma bonding, these all play a role in what gets us addicted. And I really want to start a dialogue on what makes it so difficult for survivors to leave this type of abusive relationship. It's so true because we, it, you know, people talk about Stockholm Syndrome. They don't understand. I just wrote mm -hmm. an essay on my personal blog um, about this particular subject that, you know, there's a difference between being a selfish jerk and being a disordered mm -hmm. selfish jerk. And the people that have been narcissistically abused and know what trauma bonding is, we absolutely know the difference. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I find interesting is that, you know, the DSM has a lot of helpful information on the characteristics of a narcissist, but unless you're in a relationship with a malignant narcissist, it can be very difficult to understand the type of covert methods they use to put you down. And it often escapes us because narcissists have that false self, that charming self that they present to society versus their behaviors within intimate relationships. And they can really project their own traits onto you and gaslight you into believing that you're the abuser or yes. that you're the narcissist. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, the years you spend thinking, am I the narcissist? Was I the bad one? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And what's really important to remember is that, you know, narcissists don't outright destroy you in the way that perhaps someone who's physically abusive might do, mm -hmm. they plant the very seeds in your mind that will lead you to self-destruct. Right. You know, they'll cultivate doubts in your mind, they'll manufacture insecurities, um, they'll reopen old wounds and create new ones, and then they're able to rewrite the abuse they've inflicted. They tell you that, oh, you're crazy, you're imagining things, you're being way too sensitive. And you know that's the type of crazy making that's so covert, and it's hard to explain to someone who's never been abused in that manner. I know I've had people when I've I've laid out exactly the scenario of what's gone on either to me or to someone else and it's mm -hmm. they're, they're shocked and horrified and at the end they're well maybe he really wasn't that bad. Are you sure it was um I just go mm -hmm. okay you're either in denial 
or you've never been this <laughs> kind of abuse. <laughs> oh my God, yes. When they say, are you sure this is really abuse? Because I think when we think of the uh, abused person, we think of physical wounds and narcissists and other toxic partners who are emotionally abusive can leave even worse scars that you know last for a lifetime. You know, They can really shake your own beliefs about yourself, erode your identity and your confidence. And um, it's almost like they're saying, like, hey, take my pathology. You know, I don't want it. And they're, like, exactly. giving it to you. I always think of it as, uh, you know, we end up being their receptacle, um, the receptacle mm -hmm. of their depravity um, while they're puffed up on all of our goodness. Oh, my God. That's a great way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So how does a person become narcissistic? So there's several different theories on how a person develops narcissistic personality disorder. So some psychologists theorize that, you know, a narcissist might have suffered something, what, we, what they call a narcissistic wound in childhood, and this is some sort of severe trauma, and it could have been caused by a very cold, unempathic parent who neglected them, abused them, or invalidated them in some way. And then there's another theory which goes in the opposite direction and says that it's a pattern of overvaluation that the parent actually spoils the child and makes them feel very superior and doesn't give them the realistic feedback that they need in order to become a very like full person right. so it leads to a lot of arrested emotional development and the child becomes very grandiose and they feel superior and haughty and they start treating people like objects and, you know, some of these parents can also live vicariously through their children. Right. So I'm just thinking in our, in our own culture, I'm thinking of the show Toddlers and Tiaras. Oh, yeah. Um, just because that's such a Breeding ground for narcissism. Uh -huh. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's such a great depiction of how narcissistic parents themselves can create narcissistic children because they live through their children and then they treat their children like objects. And that child grows up to have all sorts of... Um, difficulties with their interpersonal relationships because they don't like consider people as whole they consider people as objects to be used right and extension of them. I always think they think of you as a limb mm -hmm. but when you do want to break away and make a healthy boundary they're like they're so upset because it's like you're cutting off you know one of their own mm -hmm. you belong to mm -hmm. them exactly and I always say that narcissists have very strong boundaries um, because they don't allow you to uh, cross their boundaries. But when it comes to creating your own around the narcissist, you know, don't even think about it. Right. That will just cause a narcissistic injury and rage. Right. Exactly. Um, and, <laughs> and then there's also the biological standpoint, and that's more about how research has shown that the brain of an actual person with NPD has structural abnormalities, and those structural abnormalities are in the parts of the brain that are related to compassion and empathy, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's all these different theories, but I definitely, psychopathology is, you know, created by this interaction between nature and nurture. So definitely the environment as well as the biological predisposition, they work together to create this disorder. And, you know, while survivors can't be 100% certain what caused their par partner's NPD, what they can be certain of is that being with a partner who has NPD can be very one-sided because people with narcissistic personality disorder, they lack the ability to empathize. And that's a key element of having a healthy relationship, you know, and they exploit others for their own gain and agenda. So you will ultimately be used as a source of supply if you're with a narcissist. And if you try to, you know, get support for that, the false self of a narcissist can even convince your own support network that, you know, they're not who you say they are. So right. a lot of people won't even believe you if you say that this person treated me this way or abused me this way because they're so used to seeing the narcissist's false self, you know. Right. Uh, only in intimate relationships or in closer relationships do narcissists actually reveal their true selves. So it can be very hard to even gain a validating support network when you're trying to get support. Um, in this type of relationship. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I watched myself sort of turn into the work wife um, and, mm. and figured out, oh, that's why she's always so disdainful and rude and would say things to him in the office like uh, just rude, 
a barrage mm -hmm. of insults to him in the office so you, in front of his staff so you'd think that she was the abuser but as i mm -hmm. was around him more and more and he was close he got close to me i saw how he really is and i started treating him just like her and i thought mm. oh my god this he's he's created this she is the story with him was oh i'm so abused by my wife she's so awful blah 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 and the reality was no you you you've turned her into that because she turned me into that too Oh my God, absolutely. And this is also a key reason why narcissists are able to triangulate us so effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Because during the relationship, uh, they might actually devalue their ex-partners. They usually do devalue them and say, like, you're not nothing like my ex-partner. You know, she was crazy. He was, he was crazy. And then you start to realize that, no, it's actually that you made them act this way. Right. And and you provoke them into acting that way. And so once you get deeper into a relationship with the narcissist, you start to realize that their ex-partner is probably right about them, and you guys should probably meet up and share notes. Oh, yes, <laughs> I know. I did end up having a wine-soaked meal with his <laughs> who who told me all about their marriage, and I sat there going, oh, my God, this sounds exactly what I'm dealing with with him. Oh, thank God we mm -hmm. had dinner, and I sit with you in your disgust. So, yeah, oh my goodness, it, yeah. Was, it was and, fascinating. Yeah, and you know what a favorite saying of a narcissistic partner would be is that, oh, um, you're the only one who's ever had this type of problem. With yes, you. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any type of abuse that they throw at you, they will just say, well, my ex-partner never did this. My ex-partner was all, was all right with name-calling, was all right with stonewalling and emotional withdrawal. You know, my ex-partner had no problem with that. And then you, if you have happened to ever meet the ex-partner, you realize, no, they did have a problem with that. Right. You were just exactly. gaslighting me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, too, um, you know, some of the disbelief is because they don't show their true ugly self mm -hmm. with everyone they have a new mm -hmm. face for each person and it's a compliment quote unquote that they mm -hmm. when they really have unleashed with you because they've emotionally they've in their very shallow emotion they've bonded with right. you so you see that real ugliness but some of the people the other people around them you know they see a selfish person but they don't see the real evil person and so they do look at you like god what is your problem why are you so overwrought yeah he's the selfish jerk but he's not like you know what you're mm. saying he is and you and you do start to feel like you're going crazy but you have to realize later when you have distance well the, he didn't ever show that or she because there's plenty of women that do it too um that person didn't show that deplorable side with everyone they and sometimes they do it on purpose they if they mm -hmm. really want to get someone that they as a high dollar value supply they want to manage them down they're gonna mm -hmm. um they're gonna you know really show you that evil side um so that you can start to look like you're insane in front of all the other people that believe their mask of goodness so that's always fascinating and traumatic oh, definitely and not only that, but this doesn't just apply to intimate relationships, but also work relationships, oh, yeah. too. Uh, definitely with the experience of workplace bullying, mm -hmm. I feel like if there's a narcissist in your workplace, everyone else will usually gravitate towards them, will find them very charismatic. And if you're in any way a threat to them in some way, then they will, again, like you said, manage them down. They will manage the person that they feel threatened by down and they will bully them yes. and really show their true ugliness to them. So it's not just in intimate relationships that we have that managing down, but also in friendships, in the workplace, um, even online in cyberbullying and plagiarism. And that's also, I have a whole chapter also dedicated in my book about kind of like a side note chapter mm -hmm. about the other contexts where we experience narcissistic behavior. Mm, fantastic. Now, you talked a little bit about this gravitating towards them. Is there such a thing mm -hmm. as chronic victimization, a person who, you know, has had multiple, I know the answer to this, but, you know, for our mm -hmm. audience, um, you know, what if you're someone who's had multiple narcissistic relationships? Absolutely. Chronic victimization is a lot more common than we think. So a lot of victims feel embarrassed or ashamed um, sometimes about talking about this because they feel like, well, I should have known better. Um, you know, why am I, why do I keep going through this? Right. And 
the reason is, is that narcissists don't really appeal to our logical thinking mind. They target the areas of our brain that are very emotional. So when you have chronic victimization, it's most likely because you've been subconsciously programmed, even from childhood, to be primed for narcissistic abuse. Right. So, for example, people who have witnessed domestic violence when they're growing up, people who've had narcissistic parents, they're already being instilled that belief that you're not good enough, um, you're worthless. And these types of beliefs really mirror how narcissists treat us in the devaluation and discard phases of the relationship. And we can be programmed to feel this way, you know, even in the womb. You know, there's this great book um, I read called The Biology of Belief by Dr. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lipton. Great book. Talks, yeah, it's an awesome book. And it talks about um, an incredible study where a fetus on a sonogram can be shown to visibly respond to a fight between mom and dad. And so even as early as the womb, we are being programmed uh, these beliefs about love and relationships. And if we grow up witnessing domestic violence, whether it's emotional violence, psychological, spiritual, financial, or even physical, these teach us, you know, models based on abuse and disrespect, and we start to associate love with some sort of violence. Right. And, you know, trauma in early childhood is obviously going to rewire the brains so that we have, you know, a different type of personality than we did before the trauma. So I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, a large part of our behavior is due to the subconscious. And so if we are experiencing something like chronic victimization, it's often because we've experienced something earlier on, earlier on in childhood or young adulthood that's rewired us and reprogrammed us um, into these false beliefs about our worthiness. Absolutely. I've certainly talked a lot about that on my show and experienced that myself, just one relationship mm -hmm. like this after another and some several at the same time because that's what was my normal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And now, and I, now I prefer yeah. to just be alone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 now I have lots of friends uh, mm -hmm. with and they're mostly therapists and people that have been on my show that I've become really close <laughs> with and they're all specialists in this and we're like a warrior tribe. Wait a minute, Kristen, what are you doing? And I'm the same with you. Wait a minute, what are you doing? This doesn't sound healthy. <laughs> but it took until 45 really to get there. So it, yeah, it can be a lifelong mm -hmm. pattern. And mm -hmm. I want to talk about that too, that, you know, why people stay so long and there's a lot of victim shaming out there. And, and I don't subscribe to the, it's all the narcissist's fault. I mean, we have to take responsibility right. for our own actions, but I'd love to hear your, you know, your thoughts on, on all of that. Absolutely. So I always say that there's a distinction between victim blaming and owning our agency. Uh -huh. um, but I definitely think that even though all of us have some sort of actual agency, that abusive relationships really hinder our sense of perceived agency. So we feel like we can't get out, the, out of the relationship, not only to those uh, trauma bonding that takes place, but also due to the uh, biochemical bonding that we experience. So again, like yeah. I talked about, many of us are subconsciously um, programmed towards abuse due to our experiences in childhood. Um, but also, there can be a lot of biochemical bonding. So as I mentioned earlier, hormones and chemicals like dopamine, cortisol, adrenaline, and oxytocin, they can really, really hook us into the narcissist using our own brain chemistry. And what many people don't realize is due to the traumatic highs and lows of this type of relationship, this type of bonding can be even more strong yeah. than a regular normal relationship. Uh, um, yeah. So, for example, in a regular normal relationship, you do not go to sleep thinking about this person. Wake up at two thirty, mm. go to the bathroom, and they're the first thing on your mind, and wake up. And then go back to sleep finally and wake up and think about them again and wish that you had, you know, a pair of shears to give yourself a lobotomy so they could get out of your head. <laughs> Normal relationships Absolutely. don't do that. And that's mm -hmm. the chemical piece that, you know, that people mm -hmm. don't understand that, you you know, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, for example, like dopamine, which creates those reward circuits in our brain. So during the idealization phase of this type of relationship, we're groomed to the point where we're so in love. And okay. so this creates a lot of a lot of reward circuits and it 
we, we are forced to kind of relive those pleasurable memories over and over again. But then comes the devaluation stage and the hot and cold maneuvers of the narcissist. And it's something that we call intermittent reinforcement. So the narcissist will periodically kind of sneak in those tender moments again within the abuse cycle. So they might treat you very viciously, but then they'll merge these ab abusive incidents with, you know, moments of tenderness, love, affection. And actually that affects dopamine and the reward circuits. They actually strengthen the reward circuits when an abuser does that to us. Absolutely. So because dopamine flows more readily due to that kind of inconsistent reward schedule. So it's it's so important to think about all of these things that are happening within our bodies too, because I think the primary discourse right now on abuse survivors are that, you know, oh, they're weak minded, but really when you think about it, we've been through such so much trauma that it's amazing how we've been able to really survive this type of traumatic high and low relationship and this kind of crazy making that a narcissist instills in us. Um, especially when our brain, our own brain chemistry is against us. I mean, we have all this attachment and trust Absolutely. due to the oxytocin that's released when we're physically with our partners. Our cortisol levels are going um, haywire at this point. A lot of stress in our bodies. And then we have the adrenaline rush and we get into the adrenaline rush of how unpredictable and dangerous the narcissist is. So the abusive style of the narcissist actually tricks our brain chemistry into feeling as if we have this strong, deep bond with them. Right. And again, I talked about trauma bonding. We both talked about trauma bonding, and they can also, you know, reinforce trauma bonds and can awaken new ones. You know, trauma bonding is that defense mechanism that helps us survive this type of abusive relationship. Right. But it also makes it very difficult to get out of it. It does. It becomes glue that you, you know, you, the super glue that keeps you stuck there. And the only thing, mm -hmm. I just try to get this to people, no contact. You have to be away from them in order for your body mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to start regulating itself. And, you know, for me, I learned, do, I did a lot, do a lot of like purification, healthy, you know, purification programs with organic fruits and vegetables and blah, blah, blah. And also feeling my emotions um, because it's a drug, they're a drug for us too. I mean, that, that high mm -hmm. that from mm -hmm. the high and low of the relationship becomes addictive, just like heroin and just like we're heroin for them. And when you're without it, because you're no contact, that's what you're, you know, you're, it's, you've, you're going cold turkey. And I've, I've literally felt the flood of, of dopamine, you know, racing mm. through my body and sat there and gone, okay, now I know what this feels like and I feel what this is actually doing to my system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And another thing to consider is how victims are unable to get support. Yes. Um, because they, people don't have this type of knowledge about abusive relationships. And society believes that victims stay of their own free will and their own agency. And while it's true that we do make a choice to stay in this type of relationship, a lot of our choice is negated by these types of bonds. And because we're unable to get, get a validating support network, the victim feels so alienated and isolated. Right. And they don't feel like they can... They don't have. They feel like they don't have anything after the abuse relationship. So they feel, why should I get out of it if there's no one there to even support me? And people might, you know, gaslight them or invalidate their accounts of the abuse. Um, so they might feel like maybe I'm not being abused. So they start to convince themselves. There's a lot of, you know, cognitive dissonance at work. A lot of learned helplessness and powerlessness. And we have to understand that, you know, all of these bonds, um, biochemical trauma learns helplessness, powerlessness, these all really negate our sense of perceived agency. And that's why it's so difficult. And this poor kind of support system that we have in place is really due to the stereotypes we have about abuse survivors. Um, so it's really important to change that discourse so that abuse survivors can get that type of support that helps them to lead these types of relationships. And you know, you, you know, you had said earlier it can happen in work relationships. It was so affirm mm -hmm. it was so affirming for me with this one that I worked mm -hmm. with, where I was the quote unquote work wife. Um, a couple years later, I get a phone call just out of the blue, randomly from 
that's one of his clients that um, was using his company's services and he he did he didn't know that I used to work with this person I didn't bring it up and he right. said really? I think this guy you know because this guy's a counselor he said I think no I know that this guy's an access to I know he's got antisocial personality disorder and I said you know what dude I will help you with whatever you want thank you for affirming <laughs> exactly what I experienced <laughs> mm -hmm. that's wonderful that's great yeah a lot of people don't unfortunately get that type of validation so right even if it's just one person who says hey I know what, exactly what you're talking about it can leave a survivor feeling supported and validated for the first time and that can help them really recover and heal uh, sharing your story with just even one survivor and having that survivor validate your experience can be incredibly healing. So yes. yeah, I definitely know what, what you're talking about. <laughs> so is there, and this is a really good question I know because I've experienced both, um, is there a difference between mm. narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, and another uh, and other cluster B disorders like borderline personality disorder? Yes, absolutely. So these two disorders have a lot of overlapping symptoms, you know, they both engage in interpersonal manipulation. Both of them have this chronic sense of emptiness or void, and they both need uh, external validation from their environment. Narcissists need supply, and horror lines need this reassurance, this constant reassurance that they won't be abandoned right. uh, by the people that they love. And they both experience the intense emotion of rage. Oh, but yeah. what I find is different, <laughs> yes, so what I find is different between uh, both of them is, first of all, the degree to which they can experience empathy, uh, and then second of all, the motivations behind why they have such difficult interpersonal relationships. And I guess the final point would be their, the effectiveness of treatment on both disorders. Um, so for the first point, BPD people have a greater ability to empathize than NPD people. And that's actually precisely because they experience such intense emotions. Um, you know, BPD people are more likely to fear abandonment, while narcissistic individuals are like more likely to initiate abandonment. Right. Because they have such a shallow range of emotions, they can't really empathize with others. Um, and BPD people, on the other hand, they experience the full range of emotions. But imagine that um, it's like a, an emotional radio, like you have the sound level up 10 times greater than anybody else. Right. So that's what BPD people tend to experience is that they have the emotional volume on 100 times more, whereas narcissists have like <laughs> below zero. <laughs> right. So it's right. very different the way they experience relate, uh, emotions. Now, borderlines can be mistaken to not have empathy because they seem so absorbed in their own emotions. Mm -hmm. um, because they're so intense, but it's actually narcissists who actually do have that shallow range. Whereas borderlines, if they kind of mindfully and start to mindfully reapproach everything, they can understand other people's emotions. In fact, there was you know recent research done that showed that borderlines can be even more discriminating of you know people's emotional states and mental states than people who don't even have a BPD. Right. Because they have those intense ranges of emotions. Um, so, again, the emptiness uh, that BPD people is feel that BPD people feel is a bit different. You know, they do need people for validation, but they're driven by the fear of abandonment. And so it's not that they want to manipulate people, but they do it because they're struggling with this chronic sense of emptiness, loneliness, and this fear, this absolute dreadful fear that they're going to be abandoned. Right. Um, Whereas NPD people, they enjoy, I feel like they enjoy provoking others. You know, it gives them this narcissistic supply where their sense of superiority is validated when they get that reaction from others. And because they don't have that the intense emotional experience, um, they feel emotionally numb and provoking others into reacting gives them this sense of superiority, oh, fills that need for attention, you know. Um, and it's what we have to remember is that... Sadistic pleasure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's their sadistic pleasure, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, there's differences in the way that they seek out treatment or the effectiveness of treatment. 
um, BPD people because they tend to self-injure or self-harm. Um, many of them are hospitalized because of that, and they do benefit from therapies like DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, and that's more of like a mindfulness approach to interpersonal effectiveness that teaches them coping methods. Uh, whereas NPD people are unlikely to seek treatment right. because it's inherent in their disorder. They don't feel as if they need treatment. They feel superior to others. Right. So they don't feel like they need help. So really, I'm obviously abuse is still abuse no matter what disorder someone has, but I think that these two disorders have been used so interchangeably that it's important to contextualize yes. these different experiences because someone with BPD is can be very different and can do things for very different reasons um, than someone with NPD. That's very true. And I've noticed, and I've talked about this with my colleagues, um, especially my colleague Michelle Malin, who does so much um, mm -hmm. advocacy out there. Um, a lot of times a victim will show up in therapy and they're misdiagnosed as borderline mm -hmm. or um, you know manic depressive or you know it's just completely misdiagnosed because they've been so gaslighted and managed down and so on so that leads mm -hmm. me to my next question to you does therapy or can therapy help or hurt a victim of narcissistic abuse um. Um, so it depends on the therapist. So, right. Right. Um, you know, depending on whether the mental health professional you're seeking help from is actually experienced and trained in this type of abuse or trauma. So if even if they have a good understanding of trauma, they can, you know, read up on narcissistic personality disorder a little bit more, read more survivor accounts online, and start to really delve into the research and teach themselves if they're willing to do that and they're receptive to learning more about narcissistic abuse. I think you know. It can definitely be very helpful, but what you need is a very sensitive and validating person. So because a lot of professionals who don't understand these complex dynamics might not recognize these covert underhanded tactics. And I've experienced this myself. Like I think that a lot of therapists think that, well, if you're in therapy, we're going to work on you. We're not going to work on the abuser, obviously, so we're going to work on how you are approaching this. And if you think something's abusive, unfortunately, a lot of therapists think that it's your problem and you have to look within. And while I think it's admirable to look within and you do have to improve yourself, this type of invalidation can make victims feel as if the, the abuse that they're experiencing is not real. It's all in their heads. So in addition to having a very supportive, validating counselor who understands narcissistic abuse, I think it's very important for survivors to reach out to other survivors. Yes. Because they're the ones who know what this is like. Yeah. Um, you're not going to find a more accurate reading <laughs> than someone who's actually been in this type of relationship, um, especially if someone's been in this type of relationship more than once or they were raised by a narcissistic parent. Um, this type of abuse is, is almost the type of abuse that only survivors can really accurately speak to. And unfortunately, it's right now, the, the best voices on this topic are survivors themselves. Absolutely. You know, of course, there's mental health professionals who've also experienced it in their yes. personal lives. And, you know, they're also, you know, amazing at talking about this. Um, but again, the survivor voices is really important, and connecting to that survivor community can be very important, too. It's very true. I mean, as much education and reading as you can, the only thing that I, I caution people mm -hmm. about is, um, you know, go to a life coach, go to a licensed clinical professional uh, that has mm -hmm. training in this specific mm -hmm. abuse, and I even say, and has been through this abuse themselves. So I get emails mm. constantly and I um, you know, I'm in Canada, I'm in the Netherlands, I'm in Belgium, I'm, you know, I'm in, well, I had somebody from South Africa. I've had people all over Australia, a lot of people in Australia um, email me and say, can you help me find a therapist that knows what this is, you know, where, where I'm at. And I do mm. the best that I can um, to help them. But I always say, here's the questions you need to ask the therapist. Do they know what narcissistic abuse is? And they have to they, mm. they, yes, they have to explain what it is. Do they know what trauma bonding is? What types of therapy do they know helps treat 
narcissistic abuse victims because if they know they're mm -hmm. if they know what they're talking about they're going to say PTSD, CPTSD, mm -hmm. trauma therapy, you know, they're going to say those things and have you ever been narcissistically abused? Now, a therapist who's been narcissistically abused is going to be okay with saying, "Yes, I have." They don't have to tell you how mm -hmm. they were, but they aren't because they're going to understand why you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the people, you know, I happen to know many, oh my God, just the amazing therapists that, um, that mm -hmm. know what this is because they've been through it themselves. And because I'm on a colleague and close friend level with them, you know, they're being the therapist with their clients, but with mm -hmm. me because of our friendship, they're, they're, you know, calling me and I'm calling them and going, can you believe, you know, they're showing me how they're gaslighted and they're, cause it affects <laughs> yeah. them too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's not, you know, you don't just snap out of it and get over this. It, you can be triggered over a lifetime uh, with different things, um, depending on just how horrific you know, the abuse was. So, um, so that's been nice for me to see too. And I, I think a lot of victims don't get that kind of bird's eye view that I do where, yeah, mm. I get to, I get to see that the, the therapists that specialize in this and their own trauma. That's and, amazing. And I, and I wish that, you know, every victim could have a counselor like that because it can be so helpful yes. um, to not be invalidated. And, you know, a, lo a lot of therapists, even though they might not literally say, let it go, they have that kind of attitude. Yes. Unfortunately, we if they, if they don't have this, you know, <laughs> taking a whole yeah. nother hour to talk about this. And I'm like, why do I feel like crap? Because I'm talking about what I need to talk about. You know? <laughs> Exactly. They make you think that, um, you know, if you're not letting it go, it must be something about you that's holding on to this. And so, and obviously, like, we all have wounds, we all have flaws. That's what makes us human. But unfortunately, this type of abuse is so insidious that oh, even yeah. therapists themselves can't pick out what's what's really hurting you. And sometimes you can't even identify it. It's just a, a gut feeling that you have that what that person said in that tone was not right. What they did was gaslighting me. What they right. did was projecting me. So you have these kind of vague um, statements about the abuse going on, but you're not able to articulate it in a way that is in the framework of what abuse is traditionally seen as. Right. So unfortunately, you can be re-invalidated and re-victimized. So it's, it's really important for us to keep talking about this issue so that, you know, there are more mental health professionals like the one you describe and the ones that you describe and they are able to help victims. Right. Thank God it's the ones I've described and not just the one. <laughs> we <don't laughs> exactly. <horrible>. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad that's absurd. <laughs> Tell me, you know, a little bit um, how you, how did you get into this? Why is this such a hot topic for mm -hmm. you? Uh, it's such a hot topic because it's it's very personal to me. So it's something that I experienced growing up. It's something that I experienced in my relationships, in my friendships, mm -hmm. and in the workplace. So I've experienced narcissistic abuse on all different levels, in all different contexts. Right. Um, and that's why I'm so interested in, in the idea of trauma reenactment and trauma repetition. Because I think that, yes, a lot of us are programmed from a very early age and primed to meet more narcissists. Even right. though anybody can be a victim, I, I, I really believe that anybody can be a victim of Absolutely, narcissistic abuse. Yes. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how beautiful you are, how successful you are. In fact, narcissists like that. They gravitate yes. towards people with certain strengths and assets. Um, but again, it's, it's very personal to me. And actually, a, a funny anecdote that actually I want to share is um, I recently went back to my old Facebook posts and I realized that even before I started talking and speaking about narcissistic abuse, at the age of 18, I had found an article by Sam Backman mm. and I had kind of copy and pasted it into my personal Facebook. And I didn't realize this before. I just kind of went back and I was like, I knew about narcissistic abuse when I was 18. Wow. Um, but that didn't prevent me from going, you know, getting into these types of relationships because, right. again, it's not it, the logical you get thinking. It when you get it exactly, and yeah, exactly. I think I needed my father uh, dying traumatically and mm. me being bereft in grief and being out of the country to be so uh, just, you know, assuaged with trauma that I finally you know, Googled narcissistic abuse and came up with, 
you know, Andrea Schneider's articles and went, oh my mm. God, I just learned Chinese in five minutes, but I, I, <laughs> I had heard it before, but it didn't hit me until that particular moment in my life. And so you're right. It, mm -hmm. it you know, it's going to come to you when it comes to you. Absolutely. And, you know, healing is such a lifelong journey. And when I think back to when I was 18 versus when what I am now, like 25, all of these years that passed, I think that I didn't have my true reawakening because I had forgotten totally about Sam back then when yeah. I was 18. I posted that and then I just completely forgot about it for a little bit. And then when I started being reawakened, I, I went on this forum, Psychopath Free. Um, yes. And Such it told me. Jackson McKenzie is wonderful. Yes, I love him. And he was the first one to ever review my first book. And he was just so supportive. And I think that's what really saved me was having a community of survivors to connect with. And, you know, these survivors were my saviors because they really helped me with new contact. They helped me learn the vocabulary of narcissism. And that's why I stress that it's so important to learn more about survivors' accounts. And that's what I want to do with this book that I'm working on, too, is really uh, bridge that gap between the scientific research and survivor accounts because I think coming together, merging those together can really give us a full picture of what narcissistic abuse looks like. You know, it's not what it looks like in the DSM, definitely not, you know. No. I, was, I was taking an adult personality in the psychopathology course and when I first really learned the DSM definition and I did not connect it at all to my experiences. And that just goes to show how right. the clinical perspective alone cannot do justice to no. this type of abuse. You know, it's funny. I had a therapist say to me, um, <laughs> he said, you know, we could we could quickly get into comfortable speak because we we're colleagues standing there talking. I'm not a therapist, but I was there doing something else in his practice. And um, right. he was talking about his father and how his father had narcissistically abused him. And um, that's mm. how why he treats people that he does with this. Mm. And that when his father died or his father was in the hospital on his last legs, he um, he came in and he could not go near him. Uh, he sat in a corner in a chair. And just before his father passed, he, his father sat up and said, it's so hot. It is so hot. Mm. And then he died. And the the, my colleague looked at his at his wife and and said, um, "Yeah, I bet it's hot where he's going." <laughs> <laughs> and I and I laughed because I get it. I get it. He goes, "You know, yes. Kristen, you're you're like one of five people that I could say that to. That's not going to point mm. their finger and go, you horrible person saying that about your father." Oh, I said, "No, no, no. Right, right. I totally get it." <laughs> Right, exactly. Like I said, like only a person who's actually survived this type of abuse can really fully get it, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, and I get, I get a lot of letters from people who do have narcissistic family members, and they ask me, like, is it okay to go no contact with someone who, like, might get sick, right. and, you know, we don't want to waste that time with them, and, you know, I always caution in, in the way of self-care, like what can you do to take care of yourself? If you're going to interact with them, what are you going to do to really take care of yourself during this time? Right. Um, because at the same time that you don't want to have any regrets, uh, you also don't want to waste so much of your energy trying to maintain an, an un unsustainable toxic relationship. Absolutely. And you know, I was thinking about this when you're talking about your Facebook posts. It's so mm -hmm. interesting on the journey. I'll go back and look at the things that I was posting, uh, you know, right at, in the beginning of knowing what this was. I was so angry. Oh my God, I've never <laughs> yeah. been so angry in my entire life. And I would, I would literally, uh, I used Pinterest like crazy. Just, <laughs> I mean, it was just so affirming to just be like, you know, and I ended up with like 5,000 pins all about narcissistic <laughs> abuse. And I finally, <laughs> Finally, one day I just went, okay, I'm done, you know, with that. And I deleted the whole thing that had taken me months to create. And then it quickly, it filled back up to, up to like 3,500 pins. And then I, you know, I got, I got through it and I deleted that one. And now, you know, it's like a normal amount, but we have to go <laughs> through that stage of being just yeah. ferociously ferociously angry um, in order to get through this. And my God, do we deserve to be that angry? I, yeah, I so agree with you. I think 
that reawakening has a lot to do with accepting and embracing our own anger and grief because when we first start to realize that people who people who are narcissistic are doing this deliberately yes and you know we we tend to project all sorts of things onto people when we first meet them so you know and that's very dangerous in a society yes, where it is especially if you're like one you're an empath all you're doing is projecting <laughs> goodness, goodness and light on everybody and they're you know and for some people they deserve it and other people are you know don't and you're and that can Absolutely. be very dangerous <laughs> It can be. I mean, I think the st statistic is one in 25 people are sociopaths. Yeah. So when we're projecting our conscience onto them, we really don't know if they have a conscience, if they have any right. remorse or the ability to empathize. And I think that's why narcissistic abuse and the discussion of it is, is so important because it affects all of us in all walks of life, in all stages of life, yes. in all these different contexts, whether it's the workplace, whether it's friendships, whether it's family, whether it's relationships. So it's really important to discuss discuss it on all levels, even online, because you know cyberbullying and plagiarism, those are also narcissistic behaviors yes. too. And I, I also talk about that in my book. Yeah, they are. They they absolutely are. And you know, it's it you have to be careful with online stuff mm -hmm. too because if it's not moderated properly, you know, I've I've run across many um like my circle is sort of the online police about these things, people that claim that they're healers and there really are actually um, abusers mm. are out there mm. and um you know, we're very cognizant of of where those are and when people come to me and ask or they ask my tribe as we call ourselves um you know what do you think about this site or that site we'll say you know we're not like immediately judgmental but we'll say well we've seen a lot of people get re-traumatized going there so you might want to switch and go to psychopath free or you might want to switch and go to you know this other one that that is really about healing mm -hmm. so, definitely mm -hmm. and definitely it's very important to Think about the resources that we use to exactly. recover and heal. So let's talk about the tools that people can use mm -hmm. to detach and heal from a narcissist. Right. So again, there's no you know one package for every survivor that fits all. Um, it's really about a combination of techniques that you know um, cater to you and your needs. So I've heard from many survivors that they've experimented with, you know, both traditional and alternative remedies. Mm -hmm. And for traditional remedies, you know, again, we talked about this earlier, therapy with a professional who's actually trained in narcissistic abuse and trauma, mm -hmm. you know, is very important. Um, meditation, you know, meditation definitely helps us rewire our brain, uh, makes us more mindful. And if we're going through, you know, what I recommend as 90 days of no contact to right. get yourself off of that, addiction to that drug that is the narcissist, it can be very helpful in order for you to just step back, take a breath, and reevaluate what's going on. And again, it literally changes your brain. So you're not stuck in that fight or flight mode. You're actually able to think a lot more critically about your behavior. Um, and you're able to kind of start to defeat that addiction that's, you know, been wreaking havoc on your body. And related to that, yoga, I would definitely recommend uh, some form of yoga because it not only teaches you physical resilience and flexibility, but it also gives you a lot of psychological resilience. Um, and personally for me, I, I love Bikram yoga, Hatha yoga, um, but it's really up to the survivor whether they engage in yoga or not, but I feel like there's some sort of yoga for everyone because right. there's so many different forms. Um, writing, I definitely recommend writing. Um, whether you're <laughs> yeah. going on a survivor forum, you are going to write, 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 write. Oh, yeah. And that's going to help, it's going to help you reconnect to that reality that you were so disconnected from because your abuser was gaslighting you projecting their traits onto you, making you feel really terribly about yourself. So writing is that, what I talk about in my first book is this idea of reverse discourse. So it's all about rewriting the narrative that other people have written for you. Mm. So bullies and narcissists, you know, they write these narratives for you that program your brain into thinking these really terrible false beliefs about yourself. And it's up to us to really start to take back control of that language and start to really rewrite our narratives about ourselves, you know. And positive affirmations can really help with that as well. Um, I've 
I definitely got a lot of <laughs> positive affirmations right. um, throughout my healing journey, and that's really helped me reprogram my own beliefs about myself uh, due to the experiences that I had. Um, so there's just so many techniques that you can use. You know, there's Reiki healing, there's acupuncture, aromatherapy, um, EDMR therapy, um, yes. emotional freedom, emotional freedom technique. So it's it's really up to the survivor to pick which ones are most effective for them. It's important to really experiment with all of them to see what's going to be most effective for me, what's going to be more, most practical for me, what makes me feel emotionally safe. Um, and again, it's important to have a validating counselor or coach who's really trained in this type of abuse, you know. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking that one of the worst psychopaths I've ever been around, um, mm -hmm. his wife and his uh, one of his co-workers both are yoga fanatics. And I think, well, maybe that's <laughs> how they can stand to be around him. <laughs> just they are because, yeah. because they do yoga. Oh, not that oh my I... Oh, gosh. I, yoga, I, yeah. I, yoga can make you withstand a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I would do it. I'm glad I would do it and do it just for me not to be able to mm -hmm. survive. Um, I became a right, work, right. workout freak, a fiend <laughs> when I was around him because I needed a place to put, you know, everything that was going on. But yeah, it's, it's interesting that you were saying that about yoga, but um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And also I wanted to add actually physical fitness, which I didn't explicitly say, but that is really, really an amazing way to reach, like kind of channel all the anger after you've been abused. Um, because it just takes out all the energy that you've been trapping inside your own body right. uh, because of your experiences. Yeah. yeah, absolutely true. Now, narcissists tend to come back and try to contact you when the relationship has ended. Now, I've experienced that and I've certainly experienced the long, silent treatments and then all the sudden, mm. you know, I want to connect with you on LinkedIn or I want to... <laughs> uh, you know, I can't live without you, I can't do this without you, blah, 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 and those were always followed up with, if I chose to bite, those were followed up with even worse, um, mm. almost like I was being baited just so that I could be discarded yet again, so mm -hmm. in a worse way, so, but why do they, um, you know, do they come back? So they come back um, for a number of reasons, but they all have to do with control mm -hmm. and the loss of control. So if a narcissist discards you first, they feel that sense of control and triumph. But if you decide that you're going to heal and move on with your life, you might even meet a new partner or you might be on a new business venture. You might be thriving. That's when they'll usually crawl back into your life, of course, uh, when you're at the height of, you know, your recovery. And that's because a narcissist intuitively senses that loss of control mm -hmm. that they once held over their victim. And they want to feel superior. Again, a sense of superiority is, is vital to them. So when someone is moving forward with their lives, they're no longer the pawn in a narcissist's game. They're no longer the object that they can control. So they want to suck you back in. They want to hoover you back in to the trauma of the relationship so they can discard you um, in a way that's even more horrific than the last discard. You know, It's a way for them to reinforce the, the control that they once had and re uh, really feel like they're superior to you. Um, so it's important that you know, whenever we're being hoovered, just stay mindful. And that's why I also recommended meditation because... Meditation can also help us really radically accept our cravings mm -hmm. and urges. So if we feel baited into responding to the narcissist, um, we'll feel more mindful if we've taken a step back and started to track, you know, what am I feeling when the narcissist contacts me? You know, how am I being triggered? Right. Why, why do I feel the need to respond to this person? And again, we're also withdrawing from biochemical bonds, so we're right. going to feel these intense cravings and urges um, to, you know, look them back, look them up on, on social media, or answer their texts, or even text them ourselves. So no, no contact can really help with mm -hmm. severing all the ties. But if a narcissist hoovers you, it's important that you practice a lot of self-compassion and self-acceptance. So if you do fall off the wagon, which is sometimes inevitable because relapse is an inevitable part of addiction. I don't think a lot of abuse survivors uh, want to 
feel that way because they want to blame themselves. They have this urge to blame themselves every time they have a relapse. Right. But actually, that self-blame is engaging in that same negative self-talk that's right. going to bring you back into the toxic relationship. So it's important to practice accepting yourself, accepting those urges. If you did relapse, you have to really be compassionate towards yourself, and you have to go back on the wagon. That's the only way to maintain no contact. If you do fail, you have to just go back on the wagon, keep going, and don't stop, because eventually you will maintain no contact for a lifetime. No, oh, absolutely. But you have to, but you have to be compassionate towards yourself, um, because this is an addiction, and you will feel the withdrawal symptoms. I always say become a ninja blocker on social media. I will <laughs> family, friends of mm -hmm. that person, any coworkers that they've, anything that might be a trigger, you know, I'm just done. I block it all uh, until, you know, I, mm -hmm. and then if I go back and look, okay, yeah, I'm over it. I don't need to. And it's interesting to see a few where, I've blocked them and then I unblock them because, you know, I'm done, I'm over it, and then they'll crop up again, you know, mm. and I'll go, and and I think, I don't want them seeing that, and I have to make a choice at that time, you know, but I don't go back and look and troll, and uh, no contact is no contact, no looking, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. To me, it's that, that saying that someone wrote about it's an impenetrable wall that you, you don't know their successes, you don't know their failures, you don't know anything about their life um, or what's mm -hmm. beyond that wall anymore. They don't exist. And that's the, that's been very helpful for me. But also, you know, have a radio show where you talk about it. That's <laughs> for them to never want to talk to you ever again. <laughs> yes, I think that's a great method. <laughs> so how about relationships where... Um, the narcissist is the one who's addicted to something. Is there a difference mm -hmm. between a substance abuser who's emotionally abusive when using a, uh, when using, and a narcissistic abuser? Yes, there is a difference, even though the, the lines can be very blurred when it comes to this. So um, there is a difference between someone who's dependent on their addiction and a narcissistic abuser uh, whose substance abuse is actually comorbid. And it's important to realize this distinction because many survivors might justify and rationalize narcissistic behavior under the influence, mm -hmm. not realizing that narcissists will still continue their covert methods outside of the addiction that they have. Whatever addiction they may have, they're usually abusing you know, drugs in order to fulfill that perpetual boredom and numbness they feel, you know, it's a void inside of them. And so, again, ask yourself, is this type of abusive behavior existing, if this, is this type of manipulative behavior, I should say, and self-centeredness existing outside of the addiction? Right. Because then you don't just have someone who's an addict, you also have someone who's a narcissist. Right. And even if you cure or try to cure the addiction, that doesn't mean you're going to cure the lack of empathy right. that, narcissists, <laughs> that narcissists have. Um, so it's really important that we think about this, you know, there's a great book um, by Lundy Bancroft, you know, why does he do that? And he talks about, um, he works with many abusive partners, and he talks about how um, the partners who were addicted to drugs, um, and while they were abusing substances, even when they were not abusing substances, they were still engaging in these covert manipulative behaviors. Yes. They were a little bit more underhanded than how they were, ex how um, explicit they were when they were abusing. But again, the abuse just continued in covert and subtle ways. And these types of abusers still make conscious decisions even while um, you know, using drugs. So it's still a choice, even if they are under the influence. Right. And I think that's a distinction that's not discussed often enough because you know, we think about, well, the alcoholic and we think about abusive behavior and somehow those two get really linked. Right. Um, but it's not the alcohol that causes the abuse. It's actually the abusive person who causes the addictions, like they are the ones with the addiction to the, the alcohol because they also have this other underlying factor. But again, there are addicts without any personality disorders, and they do need support and they do need compassion, but it's important to uh, stress that distinction because uh, someone who's a narcissistic abuser with a drug problem is different from someone who's just an addict. 
Right, that's very true. And we're going to go over just because you know your stuff. So <laughs> last question anyway is um, what should survivors do with their experiences of narcissistic abuse? Absolutely. So this is so important because I think that all survivors need to take advantage of all the wisdom that they can gain from this experience. You know, it has the potential to change your life and not in just negative ways, but positive ways. You right. know? If you do have that subconscious programming from childhood, you know, meeting a narcissist can be a way to identify and heal those wounds. Um, and for people who've been narcissistically abused for the first time, this can be an opportunity for you to engage in better self-care. It can be the fuel you need to pursue bigger dreams and a brighter future. And it's also a way to learn the signs so you can protect yourself from predators in the future. You know, Now that you're on the lookout for these red flags and now that you know more about narcissists and sociopaths and manipulation, you're going to be less likely to be automatically hooked by amazing chemistry right and you will start to you know question things a lot more and that's a that's a good thing that's a good strategy to develop in relationships and, and that, that chemistry that you get can be a really good red flag I'm very oh, if I have intense chemistry I really am attracted physically to someone the first thing I say to myself is okay <laughs> shields up honey you know so mm -hmm. be careful because that's when you can, you know, be at your, your weakest moment and ignore those red flags because you're caught up in the flirt. Definitely. And again, if you are love bombed and groomed very early on and this narcissistic partner is all over you, you know, you might be tempted to feel very cherished. And, but then you realize that, you know, real love and a real relationship, an authentic relationship often takes time to grow. Right. Um, so when you've been through this type of experience, you start to realize that love is proven by actions more so than words, and it's proven more in a long-term um, timeline than a short-term one. Short -term one. Um, so again, like when I think about how this affects the romantic relationships in the future for survivors, you know, a lot of survivors reach out to me and they tell me that they met the love of their lives after narcissistic abuse, and then right. there's others who are still searching but they're both still, both types of people are still leading a healthier life without their narcissistic partners, you know, and both of these are ideal outcomes. And so while I can't guarantee that everyone who's ever been narcissistically abused will immediately meet the love of their life after leaving their partner, um, I can guarantee that, you know, all survivors, they're all worthy and deserving of, you know, healthy, emotionally safe love. Yeah, so it's really important for them to you know, educate themselves about this type of abuse, and one of the best way best ways of healing that I found was empowering other survivors and supporting other survivors. Because yes. when you write about narcissism, when you talk about it, when you blog about it, you start to raise awareness and you start to rechannel your experiences into the greater good. Yep. And when you help another survivor heal, you help yourself heal. You know, and this type of abuse is just one, one part of a larger problem in society, you know, a lack of empathy is rising in our population yes. and it's really up to us, it's up to us to um, really raise awareness. So it's important uh, for survivors to channel everything that they've gone through, all the suffering, into a greater purpose, you know, whether that purpose be reaching other survivors, whether it's you know, writing a book or helping a client in a more effective way because you learned about this type of abuse, whether it's telling a friend, it's really important that you speak about it, you continue to speak about it because when we've been through these types of abusive relationships, we start to lose our voice. Yes. And when you keep raising your voice, you strengthen that collective voice of the survivor community. And never stop sharing your story because it's not going to only change your life because you'll gain a lot of validation. <laughs> it will also change someone else's life because it will validate someone else. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I, I have the best friends I have ever had. I've, I've had a, few, you know, a <laughs> couple, instead of, you know, pre-knowing all this where I had, you know, 15 people that were, you know, narcissists, sociopaths, psychopaths, and a couple good friends. It's way, you know, now I have 
you know, well, friends all over the world now. It's fantastic. I can go mm. literally anywhere on the planet because of doing this work, this advocacy. Mm. I've got a place to stay. But the closest friendships, most supportive friendships, and I had a very soft landing after um, what happened to me with a wonderful, wonderful guy um, who's, mm -hmm. who's become a very close friend. But he was, uh, you know, we had a, a very good, romantic, wonderful relationship. And that helped mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, there, mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, well, I, I don't know that I'll ever be someone that can be mated for life. But um, now I have this great friend who was really there during, you know, the rough, one of the roughest um, relationships I had ever, ex, you know, experienced. So yeah, it, it, mm -hmm. it helps. I always tell people to doing this advocacy, you're going to meet the most incredible people that you've ever absolutely, met. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the survivors that I know are, yes, yeah, some of the most intelligent, beautiful, strong people I know. They're all warriors and yep. they've really taught me how to be a warrior to a self-care warrior. And, you know, when you are a survivor of this type of abuse, you're not just an advocate for yourself, you're an advocate for millions of people around the world. Uh, so it's really important that you channel this experience um, into this greater purpose of reaching other survivors because you will meet so many other people where you once felt alienated and alone, you will meet so many other survivors oh, yeah. who have gone through what you have. And you can really channel it into your greatest victories. You know, I would have never written a book had I never been right. through this experience. I would have never written this blog. And so it's amazing to me how we can take the worst moments of our lives and channel it into our greatest victories. And that's what I hope that all survivors do with their experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad that you came on. Um, <laughs> Please tell our listeners the name of your first book and your second book and also how they can find you. Absolutely. So the first book is The Smart Girl's Guide to Self-Care. It's available in Kindle and in print. It's actually a Kindle bestseller. And the second book is upcoming, and it's called Becoming the Narcissist's Nightmare, How to Devalue and Discard the Narcissist While Supplying Yourself. Oh, I can't so that will be wait out. to read that book. <laughs> When is that yes. coming out? Yeah. So that, it's coming out uh, later this year, so December. And hopefully the timeline will enable it to come out even earlier. But well, if you get, on it whenever right it's coming out, please, I know you're going to be busy, but if you want to do another show to promote that book, Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just shoot me an email, call me, and we'll, you know, we'll do a pre-promotion of, of that book. I want to fully support, you know, that coming out. What an awesome, what an awesome title. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, readers can reach me at my blog, selfcarehaven.wordpress.com. They can check out my YouTube channel, which is called Self Care Haven. Twitter, Self Care Haven. There's a definite theme to this. Everything is Self Care Haven. Facebook page, Self Care Haven. Uh, the only thing that's different is Pinterest. Um, I, I use the word username, God Laughs. So that's the only thing that's different. But everything else is self care haven. It's very easy to find me, um, if, you know, even if you can't spell my name. So <laughs> self care haven is where it's at. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure and an honor. And thanks to our listeners for another edition of Mental Health News Radio. Please join us next time on Blog Talk Radio. Visit mentalhealthnewsradio.com for a list of upcoming and past shows. If you'd like to be a guest on our show, please visit everythingehr.com or email me at hello at everythingehr.com. And now a final word from our therapy dog, Miles. Good boy.